Hey guys, it's John, and welcome back to The Letter, part 25. Really, little sleep was had, and I feel completely drained come morning. Even when Hana rises from bed in spite of a mild fever and invites me down to breakfast, I can't be bothered to drag myself from, from the comfort of the sheets. It's not like when I need to... It's not like I need to do something particularly important today. The rain that has started sometime during the night doesn't help the mood. Okay, maybe it helps just a little. The strange sunny weather has been nice and all, but for it to return as it should be feels like a good sign of things to come. Perhaps things will settle back to normal and the crazy drama that has gone on lately will die down. The rhythmic pitter-patter of the rain fills the early morning silence with a steady beat. Thank goodness I don't have to be anywhere in a hurry today. I would hate to be caught unawares in this rain. With how it looks outside, it seems that the weather is making up for all the sunny days it has given us with a good old-fashioned downpour. It does let up within a quarter of an hour. However, a day beginning with a cloudburst like this, locals usually take it as an immediate sign. Luxburn's abysmal weather is back. Likely for good. Alright. Well, it looks like it's... Sunny now. I hope they did a damn good job of fixing this place because I'd rather not have to deal with leaky roofs. Though Hana might find humor in it and perhaps ask me to sing in the rain to wear out my anger, I don't like the idea that the realty did a horrible patch job with the place. We, well, Hana technically, paid millions for this place. It better live up to the price the realty company sold it for. Not that it's something she should be fretting about at the moment when her health's not at its best. Hana is going to be brought to the hospital for a checkup today, and if anything, I prefer that she focus on getting better. That fever, no matter how slight it is, can't be good for her. What with her odd behavior recently. You'd think she hit her head hard against something while I wasn't looking. Perhaps a proper rest is all she needs, but I'd rather not assume things. I'm a businessman, not a doctor. Wonder of wonders why I even bother agreeing to babysitting duty at that. But here I am, scheduled as today's babysitter for Suarez Brat, once her father drops her off the mansion steps. How do you say that? Suarez's Brat. Suarez Brat. Suarez Brat. Just put an apostrophe with no S. Suarez Brat. Sounds better. Though that is a worry for much, much later. If I wish to, I can ask that nobody bother me while I doze off in a cocoon of comforters. Wow, that sounds great. But as always, someone has to be a buzzkill. Are you really going to stay in bed all day? What do you want? It's far too early to deal with your nosiness. You must have been really rattled by what happened yesterday. If you need to talk about it, I am quite qualified in that regard. It's very interesting to me how Johans... He complains quite a bit about Luke, and Luke treats him like crap, but he appears to, like, give a shit about him. Genuinely. Interesting. And you aren't even the slightest bit bothered. Truly. Not even the slightest bit worried. I was worried. But I realized that it's not my life in danger, is it? My worrying will not help matters. Neither will yours. Loath as I am to admit it, he is right. The whole thing might have rattled me, but there is little point in jumping at every shadow I see from the corner of my eye. I shouldn't lose my head for a threat that might not even come. I should know better by now. A threat that might e not even come. So somebody probably at some point was like, Look over your shoulder, Luke. I'm coming for ya. But I've never been this worried about a possible threat in my life before. I'll be honest here. If anyone is, is in danger, it's Hana. I can take care of myself just fine. With security tightened, I'll have at least one guard, if not five, making sure nobody gets within ten feet from me without my say-so. Hana, on the other hand, will be away for most of the day to get that fever checked upon my insistence. It is a small relief that Johans will be with her. Are there any updates about the woman? Being in the dark has me on edge. Information, any at all, may very well help me in calming me down. I've already briefed security about her, and more from the agency will be arriving tonight. But they haven't seen anyone fitting the description. Hmm. So you have nothing then? Hmm, fat lot of use you guys are. What do I even pay you for? Do me a favor. There's the door. Don't let it hit you on your way out. God. Well, there is something. It's about McCulloch. Can anyone blame me if I show the tiniest bit of interest? She's still not done with the house, and she's a nice enough woman. Plans to go back to sleep are gone. I called her secretary about taking the day off. He hasn't heard from her over the weekend. That's because she's trapped in the basement in one of your torture chambers. She's probably passed out after enjoying a pint or two or ten in a bar somewhere. 
She's an adult. It was the weekend. She's allowed to disappear and not think about work. Fuck. I wish I was passed out after a night of drinking. He does know that mobiles are a thing. That's all well and good, but she's not answering her mobile either. Mr. Parker will be filling a missing person's case with the police if she doesn't turn up today. Certainly, someone must know where she is. Tabs are kept without fail on people who come to work with me. Background checks and constant surveillance until they've finished their contracts with the rights. Some would say it's all a bit over the top. But I can't be too safe. Too many want me dead. What about one of ours? Has anyone seen her? She's pretty hard to miss with how tall the woman is. The last anyone has seen of her was here. The morning of the party. Hmm. Actually, you are literally the last person that ever saw her. Uh, up to this point, because you saw her head into the wine cellar. Your housewarming party. But you're not going to say that, are you? That isn't good news. Mm. It wouldn't do for the police to hear of this and to suspect. It's a it's of little import that I can easily prove my innocence. It's all a matter of principle, because even the accusation of misdemeanor should not stain my reputation. Although maybe it is a bit too late to hope for a squeaky clean one. Yeah, I would say so. Besides, it'll be such a hassle to have police poking about the house looking for a body that doesn't exist. Now, if we're done here, I'd like to go back to sleep and... No, Ruth. No, Ruth. Where are you? Oh, freaking good. All right, let's do this. Well, there goes any plans of grabbing some shut-eye. Rolling over on my stomach, I can only scream into my pillow. You're not the only one. We're all right there with you. None of us like Kylie. Of course, of course. Ugh. I'm an adult pretending to be a kid. Johans, distract her. Oh, look, it's time for me to go. Have fun with your little play date. So long, farewell, and Auf Wiedersehen. Goodbye. Been waiting for him to say Auf Wiedersehen. No, Johans, don't you turn away from me. Keep her busy for an hour. Come on. <laughs> Luke's voice actor definitely has the most fun out of anyone on the cast. That's not to throw shade at anyone, either, any of the other voice actors, because I think they're all pretty competent. But um, yeah, <laughs> he definitely has the most fun. I had to press my face against the pillow once more to suppress a groan. You just can't get loyal help anymore. Hello there, little Fraulein. Your uncle is just upstairs and will be down in a moment. He is super excited to have you today. I hope you're well rested and ready to play a lot. That bastard. <laughs> I'll be down in a sec, munchkin. Let me just... Change into a fresh shirt, brush my teeth, fix my hair, bemoan my very existence. Wish I was anywhere else in the world right now. Don't get me wrong, Kylie's a great kid. Wonderful, better than most brats her age. But handling a tyke is the last thing I want on my agenda right now with this whole Hana business. Fortunately, I am well versed in how the world works. I have long learned that the show must go on, no matter what hurdles come in my way. So I set to preparing for the day. Running a comb through my hair is just divine and simply makes me feel more human. Bed hair is disgusting, though it isn't as bad now as it was when I was a child. With how expensive a trip to the barber's was, I often had to grow it out until Mother had the time to cut it out for me. Cut it for me. The curls and tangles were simply horrid. Why, I was even mistaken as a little girl because of that. It certainly doesn't help that I was named Lucille. Finally, we're going to comment on that, are we? Oh, that's it. That's the only comment. Why was he named Lucille? A freshly pressed shirt is enough to chase away the last signs of sleepiness. The feel of crisp and clean cloth in my hands is a clear marker to the start of the day. Smoothing down my suit and my hair with a sigh, I steel myself for the horrors. The horrors that come with taking care of a child. Good morning to you, Luke. Good morning. Speak of the devil and she shall appear. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, Kylie grins up to me as soon as I open the bedroom door. She swings the backpack she's clutching, hitting my leg in a show of impatience and looking entirely unapologetic for it. I hate this theme. This theme is always like, something unimportant is happening. <laughs> That's what I take this to mean. Did you just wake up? Don't tell me you forgot. It's our play date today. I doubt I'd forget. Kylie's visits are a frequent enough thing that they've always found a way into my schedule. They're supposed to be visits to her godmother. 
but we can't pick who a child gets along with. So long as I'm not busy, her father can drop her off for the day. Which is all well and good for me if it makes Suarez focus on work I've given him. Besides, she's a bright child, tolerable. Kid's got a good head on her shoulders and can get pretty mature for her age at times. Of course, they have to thank me for that. Her parents can take partial credit, but Hannah and I have been there for this kid since she was just a small babe. Why, I can still remember the first time I saw her. It was during her baptism. The only reason I was there was to accompany Hannah, who was to be named Godmother. She was such a tiny thing, not even a year old, and swallowed in her mother's arm in white cloth. It was the first time I really saw an infant up close. Close enough to hold one, at least. It had been terrifying to be given a child to carry her after the whole water ceremony. I'd never done so before that, to hold a tiny life in my arms. I could have just dropped her on her head, and this little tyke before me would have stopped existing then and there. But the child just smiled at me, babbling nonsensical words as children do, and clinging to me as I, even as I tried to hand her off to Hana. She had thought it hilarious and adorable. My suit had been a mess, and I was nearly an anxious wreck by the time I handed her back to her mother. Yet it was pleasant, too. Of course I didn't, you little rugrat. I just had to take care of something before you arrived. Really? Well, I guess that's fine. As long as he told me for work like last time. Really? Now why don't we go back down and have breakfast in the parlor? I already ate at home. Papa made one of his tortilla de patatas. He wouldn't let me leave until I finished well, every bite. What was that? Tortilla? Tortilla de patatas. Okay, actually, no, 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 this isn't incorrect, because sometimes it is pronounced tortilla, oddly enough, I believe. Um, in the United States, Mexican Spanish, you would say tortilla, but I believe there's some, I don't know, is she Portuguese? Is that it? I can't remember. I don't know. It is sometimes correct. I don't know. I'm not bilingual, so. I did, I did. Minor in Espanol, but uh, yeah, there are there are regional differences, I believe. Ah, the Suarez infamous tortilla de patatas. Those things are a hazard. You can probably use one to bludgeon someone into submission with how huge they are. It's a miracle Kylie can still be so energetic. I had trouble staying awake the first time I had one. Speaking of staying awake, well, I need some coffee in me at the very least. But if you'd like, you can jump straight to dessert. It's easy enough to manage Kylie with the promise of sweets, thankfully. The hard part is managing her before she gets the sweets, because I nearly have a heart attack when the kid races down the stairs. Just the thought of her slipping and breaking her neck is enough to make me rush down after her. Stop making us feel good about you, Luke. Stop it. Uh, slow down! The food isn't going anywhere! Stop it. The food is going somewhere! And my tummy! <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Children. Language. With a shake of my head, I usher Kylie towards the parlor and order a maid to bring food for us. Whatever breakfast there is, along with a cup of coffee for me and an ice cream for Kylie. But I can't leave the kid alone for too long unless I want to let her turn the other room into a slaughter ground. You mean slaughtering ground, right? True to my expectations, I've only let Kylie alone for a few minutes, but she's already made herself comfortable. The stuff from her backpack has been left scattered around the room. That is a creepy-ass doll. From coloring books and crayons to toys, she's well-equipped to amuse herself with no trouble, though I can certainly breathe a little easier if she won't bring her doll along every time she visits. Narcissa, or Sissa, is a creepy little bugger. It doesn't help when Kylie left her during one. It doesn't help when Kylie left her during one. During one what? Finding the thing at the bottom of the stairs, staring up at me at 3 o'clock in the fucking morning is a memory that won't be leaving me anytime soon. Even now, it stares at me from where it's seated. I'm wholly tempted to just throw the thing into the fireplace and banish it from whence it came. I can buy her a prettier doll, a better toy. I will break it, find a way to get rid of it, if it wasn't from Hana, and if only Kylie wasn't so attached to it. The thing is some antique doll she found for the brat's sixth birthday, one of a kind. My darling Hana loves her so. And Kylie does try to be a good goddaughter, but she just can't keep her interest along with the wife. It's not something that Hana does wrong on her part. She does try so very, very hard. It's just that she doesn't quite know how to really handle children. She'd never been around other children when she was young, surrounded by protective adults who catered to her every whim and worried about her safety every minute. That's exactly what you're doing to Kylie. Interesting. When she isn't able to keep up with Kylie, her first instinct is to be strict. 
impose rules on the child, treat her as if she is made of spun glass like every movement might break her. I at least have some idea from being around street kids. I know the games they've played and how they think. I know that scraps and skinned knees are all part of childhood. Even with how I grew up, I had time to be a child and not some sheltered heiress. I mean, you did panic when she ran down the stairs. So, I don't know. With Kylie, as behaved as she can be with her toys and her books and her arts, she has to use up all of her energy somehow. To run around the playground and make a mess in the mud, or to even just fake wrestle for a short while. Let her be a child when she wants, I'll say. If it becomes too much, just bribe her with sweets or ship her back to her papa. Problem solved. Unfortunately, Hana isn't quite up for these sort of things most of the time, thinking it'll spoil the child. It turns the whole playdate awkward every time. Taking the last seat left, I pluck one of her coloring books from the table to see it filled with dinosaurs. Not exactly what I expect to see for a little girl, but eh, it doesn't hurt anybody. If she wants to play with dolls and cars, or dolls with their cars, what do I care? She wants to put dolls tutus on model cars, even. Oh, this is a new one. The last one you had was filled with horses, wasn't it? Those were ponies, Tio. They're much cuter than horses. But we went to a dinosaur zoo, and it was awesome! Very... you know... Very... Uh, dinosaurs are my favorite! Very? I don't know what she could be saying. Theropods? Is that even a word? I don't know. I'm... <laughs> I have no idea what that is, but it must be something. I'm only familiar with the T-Rex myself. Oh, you normie. Yeah, they found uh, fossils of its claws. They're really long. They think the whole theory might be a bazillion meters tall, even bigger than a T-Rex. What the are you talking about? I'm like fairly into dinosaurs, not like, I don't, you know, know a ton about them, but when I was a kid I used to check out dinosaur books from the library and memorize lists of their names and all sorts of nerdy crap like that. I don't, I don't really know what she's talking about. Cisa says it'll be big enough to eat all my classmates. I mean, there are plenty of dinosaurs bigger than this T-Rex, that one's not even, this not one, that one's not even in like the, you know, vicinity, like. Spinosaurus is <laughs> bigger than T-Rex. T-Rex was heavier, I believe, but there's Giganotosaurus, all sorts of all sorts of dinosaurs bigger than the T-Rex. She only laughs as I scrunch up my nose and grimace. Takako says you're making a really funny face. Takako, again. This has got to be this has got to be that ghost girl. Taka who? Takako, a friend I made. I have to stop and look around, expecting one of the help to be there. The child does have a way of befriending just about anyone, as long as she puts her mind to it. Yet the two of us are completely alone. Thankfully, she only finds my disturbed look as another funny, grown-up expression. That might be a lot more problematic than when she plays with her dolls or cars, though. Both the thought of Sisa gave Kylie ideas, and one of said ideas being Massacre by Dinosaur. Something I probably need to bring up with her father, aside from work. But beyond murderous dinosaurs, creepy dolls, and imaginary friends, I find no trouble with Kylie. She's as energetic and precocious as any tight her age can be. She's an angel if I can get, if she can get comfy and settled in after getting her sweets. All right, great. Wow, that looks. That's is that ice cream, strawberries, and blueberries on two waffles. I've never tried. It's gotta just be cream, right? It can't be ice cream, that'd be weird. I've never had ice cream on waffles. <laughs> we tuck into our waffles as soon as food is brought in. I love waffles. What time is it, 1.30? hops open. Our waffles because she wanted her own plate to go with the ice cream as soon as she saw mine. A fresh plate of berries is brought in as well, which really goes great with the rest of this feast, as Kylie puts it. And if I indulge in the sweetness, I have a cup of black coffee to pair it off with. With our bellies full, Kylie grows content with just scribbling on a scrap of paper and calmly chatting about her week. She talks of her older brother, Rowan, and their parents, how they plan to go to the Bloxland in Berkshire for the winter, winter holidays. She talks of Miss Pink, and I have to shift my legs to become comfortable once more. The memory of my initial meeting with her is still fresh on my mind. We get it, she racked you. Damn. She talks of the sad man in the park, Zack, and her new friend who likes to play hide-and-seek when she's not sniffing in the loo. When she's not sniffing in the loo. When finally she finds nothing new to talk about, she goes back to her drawings. Oh, that's Takako. Sniffing in the loo. I forgot. Okay, crying. She was crying in the loo. 
That'll change as soon as her stomach settles, of course. The calm before the storm. Because bad as she is right now, I can feel the curiosity just radiating off of her. There's a restlessness buzzing under her skin and a question on the tip of her tongue, as they often are with children their, her age. But for now, I can take this piece with no complaint for however long it stays. So wait, hang on. This just occurred to me. This thought just occurred to me. If she's talking to Takako, who I theorize is the ghost girl, but we don't know, then... Who is possessing Hana? Are there two ghosts? Hmm. Okay. I have fun with the crayons as well, at the child's insistence, even if I can't really draw. With Kylie using the black crayon, that leaves me with the blue one. I absentmindedly start to draw a puppy to the best of my abilities. It's as I attempt to give the doodle dogs another eye that Kylie breaks her silence. Tio? Where did Tia go? I saw them leave when I got here. Tia didn't look so good. I've been expecting a lot of different questions. The kid always has a whole bunch of them ready for me, but I can only sigh when she posed this particular one. Mm, she's just going to the doctors for a checkup. And as kids go, there are follow-up questions. And you didn't go with her? Well, you were going to be here, sweetie, so I had to stay behind. So she's all alone? At the hospital? Oh, no, of course not. Tia has Johans and her maid and a god. She's got plenty of company. Yeah, but you're not with her. If I know better, I'd say the kid is trying to make me feel guilty. I want to say that the little tyke is evil for making me feel so. But I understand. When I get sick, Papa and Mama have to leave me with their maids, too. Oh, they don't take care of you? That doesn't sound right. Even my mum took care of me when I was sick as a child. Well, they're always busy with work. Oh. Oh, I see. I I guess that's no good. I know she doesn't mean to accuse me of anything, but as her father's boss, maybe I do overwork Suarez a bit. There's a lot of responsibilities that only he is capable of carrying out. Delegation is a thing, sure, but when said responsibilities are legally questionable at best, putting others to the task isn't always an option. But Maybe your papa is in need of some vacation time. He deserves it, doesn't he? He's a hard worker. I could arrange something for the holidays. I could cut him some slack. Some of his assignments can wait. I can't do much for her mum. She isn't one of my employees, but this would have to suffice. It will be worth it if it makes the little girl happy, because just like that, the somber look on her face turns into one of pure joy. It's like looking at a little sun, warm and bright. It's nice to do something kind every now and then. Would you really, Tio? Would you like that? I'd like that very much, yeah! We, we can go to this museum! There's one with lots of cool trains and planes! I like trains! And there's the local meter theme park! And a monkey forest! There's a monkey a adventure forest. farm what? too, the wacky warehouse, and a play barn as well! And, and... Hey, can, we, can we go back to the monkey forest? What are you talking about? Whoa, slow down there, munchkin! <laughs> I know you're excited, but I think you should let me schedule your dad's day off before you plan a whole year's worth of stuff. <laughs> There's an embarrassed giggle, but she does reel herself in enough to calm down, which is a feat in and of itself. It's obvious how giddy she is. And if she wasn't looking forward to the holidays before, like any child should, she does now. I think Tia would be really happy if you were with her. You could have told me you needed to go to the hospital with her, Tia. I won't be angry. I'd love to be with her, but I wanted to spend time with you, Munchkin. <laughs> and she told me to stay. Besides, I don't like hospitals. They always smell like alcohol. They're not the good kind, either. I don't think anybody likes hospitals. They're scary. But you said Tia is brave and strong. That she is. A content silence comes over us as we go back to scribbling. Though I stop when I'm done with my blue dog, cringing at how awful it looks. Kylie reprimands me for that because I should be like her. The little tyke goes through several sheets of paper, one drawing after another. Practicing, she says, because practice makes perfect. Not to mention there's a drawing contest coming up in class and she just has to beat Tim from Class D, who says girls can't be superheroes. The clay gets a turn, too, when we start sculpting food and pretending we're Michelin chefs. When we're uh, too tired from tossing pizza and making cakes, there's no trouble in finding another activity more relaxing for the both of us. I find myself invested in reading The Picture of Dorian Gray once more. Often I lose myself in the pages of the book. However, it is rather difficult to do so when I'm also trying to keep an eye and an ear out for Kylie. I've been reading the same paragraph over and over again, even. Inexplicably, I can feel my skin crawl with the girl 
when the girl sits with Narcissa by the parlor's fireplace, humming, singing. Though I ignore it long enough to hear only the tail end of the song. Everything is up in flames, up in flames, up in flames. Everything is up in flames, my fair lady. We're already to the afternoon. Well, I don't think I can spend any more time with Kylie considering how high strung I feel. Let's take a look at the journal. Oh, that was it, huh? So we're nearing the end of Monday, October 31st. Check it out. Because the only uh, entry after this is Ashton saying goodbye to Rebecca. And then after that, Ashton arrives at the Ermengarde Mansion. Really? Very weird. Yeah, I mean, we're we're not very far in to Luke's chapter, so it's like, does just a lot of things happen on the last day? I don't know. So it's a good thing that Suarez came for her as soon as I've called. Though it is earlier than they agreed upon time, he voices no complaints. The bastard even has a look of relief as soon as they left. Or at least I interpret it as such from where I've stood by one of the windows, not bothering to step out and greet the man. No doubt he still doesn't trust me around his spawn. Well, he has every right to be suspicious of me. I am a dangerous man, after all. A dangerous, dangerous man! I'm a dangerous man. But to my chagrin, my chagrin, that leaves me with the rest of the day with nothing to do. Well, aside from picking up the mess Kylie left scattered about in the parlor, to my immense, immense relief, she remembered to take her doll home with her this time. But the same cannot be said of the crayons and papers littered here and there. First things first, I snatch my own doodle off the table and rip it to shreds, leaving no hope that it will see the light of day. The rest of the drawings, all Kyler's, remain unharmed as I collect the lot. Though they have been stacked neatly on the table before, they must have been blown about when I saw Kylie off. And there are plenty of them. From cats and cakes to colorful rainbows and gardens, the child managed to make a lot during her morning there. There is one more that I have to fish out of the fireplace where it landed. Expecting to see another one of Kylie's masterpieces, I am instead agreed with something a little more concerning. There's me, and there's Kylie, the two of us side by side and smiling as our stick figure selves stand in an nondescript field. That much I can ascertain without looking at the labels below the doodle's feet. But a third figure stands next to me in the drawing. A woman with her face hidden behind a curtain of black. Takako, the writing under her supplies. Takako says you're making a really funny face! Achievement unlocked. One big happy family. Taka who? Takako, a friend I made. The hairs on the back of my neck stand on end and I feel a chill go down my spine. A breath that isn't mine. That has me turning around expecting, hoping to see someone, anyone. But nothing. And that's when I hear it. Laughter. Sweet and merry laughter ringing from the ballroom. Thinking about it has my cheeks burning and my blood running hot. It's as if I'm being mocked. This is the first time he's been completely alone in the mansion. As I stomp toward the door, I have to stop myself from shouting up a storm. I expect to see some of the help dallying about, idle from their duties. Perhaps they thought they can slack off in their duties while they the head butler around in my preoccupation with Kylie. Well, they had another thing coming. But again, nothing. Nothing from what I can see with a cursory glance, at the very least. I roam around, looking for near impossible hiding places, and still, I am alone. Yet I can still hear the laughter, that accursed laughter, echoing about in the room, in my head. Who's there? Show yourselves and show some respect to the master of the house! There's, there's no one here, Luke. Cold uneasiness sells into my stomach when no one answers. I stumble on my own two feet, feeling a wave of nausea come from nowhere. I have to put a hand against the wall to stay upright when the world shifts and pain explodes from behind my eyes. It takes every ounce of my self-control not to leave, uh, not to heave, then and there. The only thing my pride allowed me to do then is to close my eyes and attempt to alleviate some of the pain. Vague, unfamiliar images, dare I say memories not mine, flash in my head, unbidden and unwelcome. Like a strong hammer strike to the head, threatening to crack my skull and split it in two. Whatever emotions they hold are muted. I'm nothing but a spectator. Still, its weight feels palpable. Though it doesn't take long for these sensations to get into my head, through my eyes and my ears, it creeps and buzzes in the spaces between. 
One after another, they come at me, an unending flood that threatens to sweep me away from what feels like eternity. Each one a show of both joy and suffering for those who have called this mansion their home. Each new scene is like a hammer to the head, threatening to crack my skull and split it in two. I can feel every little emotion in the blurry images that present itself in my head. I can feel a part of these, like I've lived through them, though I know that is not possible. All their anger burns through me, that much is evident, but the pain, the pain more so. And above all of it are the whispers, the voices calling, luring, until one image emerges in vivid contrast with the others. When there's a shout of joy, my eyes snap open, looking for the culprit. That's when the whole room just changes. Everything is the same, yet everything isn't. There are people everywhere, laughing and dancing, achievement unlocked, and living memory. I should be concerned about them, but my mind finds it easy to dismiss them as they fade in and out from nothingness. Instead, I had my concentration drawn to a man and a woman, though one can only call them a lord and a lady, going by their clothes. And oh, just seeing how happy the couple looks, though the man's eyes are eerily blank, like he's not all there. His face is familiar, though. In fact, they both are, but I can't quite place why. The portraits. The two make for a pretty picture as they dance in the center of the ballroom. Even the phantom crowd's attention stay on them. Look at Takako over here, staring at them. It reminds me so much of Hana and I during the early days of our marriage. The honeymoon years, they call it. Okay, Takako slept with the dude. So, Takako is the one who's possessed Hana. That's why she's obsessed with Luke, because Luke reminds her of him. Right? My prince and all that crap. And that's why Charlotte, the wife, had her burned at the stake. She wasn't really a witch. I mean, look. She's, look at her staring at them like that. I don't know. We were happy then, too. All smiles in her sunshine, even with the normal dreary weather. Younger, we had less to worry about, or at least thought that way. I thought, wished we could go on that way, even with what I did, all that I did and had to do. But life is a way of catching up. There was work to be done. Although we had to stay the loving, perfect couple in public, I could not afford to look so weak. To appear tied down to someone else, to those who knew who I really am. I had to harden my heart when I have business, but it hadn't always been so easy to just switch that part of me on and off. I should be concerned about their intrusion, too. Ask what bloody hell they are doing in my house, throwing a party as if they owned the place. Ask myself how the fuck I didn't notice what was going on before when the parlor and the foyer are both only a few doors away. But I have the feeling that yelling and screaming at them won't do much of anything anyway. None of the others have given me notice. I realize that this might not even be real. It dawns on me that these two are the people from the paintings, the ones all over the mansion. Which makes sense. I don't think I'm imaginative enough to make all this up on my own. This must be a dream, or a really horrible high. Just then I can feel eyes on me as I contemplate the absurdity of the situation, yet I find difficulty in trying to tear my eyes away from the two dancing. I manage, and I regret looking away. The woman from the balcony stands beside me. I can hear her rattling breath, menacing and chilling. Everything in me screams to run, but something pins me to the spot as she just looks at me, watching and waiting. The clamor of their voices fill the ballroom. Although they say such welcoming words, I do not feel comforted by the madness I'm experiencing. Their joyous voices turn sinister and foreboding to my ears. The chorus of people, people that shouldn't exist, threaten to overwhelm me, drown me even as I stand on dry land. The music still plays as the Phantom Quartet continues while I stand here, vulnerable and afraid, but the dance has already ended. And I'm afraid that I might just be tonight's entertainment. Attention is all and all well and good until bollocks like this go down. These Phantom people watch me, thousands of eyes scrutinizing, though they cheer for my return, cajole me to dance and join the merriment. There are eager hands all over, pulling me in every direction, but they do not move me enough to remove me from the woman's gaze. Listen. Can you not hear them as they welcome you on? Your kind? Our kind? What does she mean by that? You're one of us, my love. We are bonded by the blood we share. If I thought the voices were overwhelming before, it is nothing compared to how they are now. Their voices are loud, speaking in unison, and echoing o ever on in the spaces of my head. They welcome me back as if I I've always belonged, as if I was meant to be here in the first place. They call me all these titles and names that do not belong to me, and that man's face, the one with the empty eyes, flashes again before me. Once, fleetingly, like a new memory having burned itself in my mind. I have to struggle for air when I come back to myself after. I'm not. This isn't. The welcome turns into screams at my protest. 
pained and desperate pleas for my help, telling me that it is my duty to stay. <laughs> duty. Telling me that I belong among them, to them. Gentle touches turn near threatening, the warning scratches and the bearing of teeth by predators before they truly maim someone. My mouth goes dry as I struggle to speak some sense in this hallucinatory madness, but I don't get the chance as they drown out my voice. Our Lord, my prince. At her words, there is a compulsion to stay. Though my heart races to my chest, the fear I should be experiencing refuses to register in my head. Mind and body war with each other, nearly tearing me in two. Oh, you finally returned to us. Don't, I, don't, I can't do the same effect. The compulsion to walk into her arms is strong. Whispers in my head tell me to go to her. They say that she is safety. She is home and heart. We have been waiting for so long. But repulsed at these thoughts, I wrench away and turn with a small gasp. Without hesitation, I start to make a run for it. I nearly falter when an angry shriek pierces the air, inhumane and monstrous. I don't dare look back, I just run. I didn't care if this is a drug-induced hallucination or not. Just run. Out of the ballroom. And out of the parlor. We're in the evening already. It's only then that I bother to look back, hoping and praying to the god I scorn that it did not pursue me. I would have run all the way out of the mansion, too, if only someone didn't get in my way. I collide with a body much larger than mine and fall back to the ground, head spinning as I look up at the stained glass. Turning my head as this to the side replaces the colorful sight with a pair of shiny black shoes. Fatigue fills every inch of my being then, making me refuse to get up. Meanwhile, a familiar head of ginger hair looks down at me in bemusement. We know who it is. Let's just check out the journal entry. So we're, at, we're in the evening now. It's still happening before Ash has left. You really must look where you're going if you insist on running about. Do tell, where is the fire? Ah, oh, thank God you're here! I do hope you don't have a concussion. Can you count backwards from 15 to 1 for me? Oh, fuck off, you wanker! Just help me up! I do not think insulting me if you do have a concussion is a smart decision. But no, really. 15 to 1. That woman, she was here. I told you to keep an eye out for her. The other man offers an arm and pulls me to my feet then. But before I can storm off and pull him into the ballroom, he anchors me down with one hand on my shoulder and the other touching the back of my head. No bruising or bump. That still does not mean that you don't have a concussion. If you are too lazy to count backwards, can you tell me your full name? Where are you currently? We don't have <sighs> Lucille Mitchell Wright. And this is the Ermine God bloody fucking foyer. But we don't have time for this. You must make and have the time to make sure you are not broken in the head. I have already sent security to scour the whole house when I saw you running out of the parlor, Doomkopf. If the woman is here, they will have her. You will only be slowing them down if you plan to interfere. When he points that out, I realize that there are guards standing to filter into the house as we speak with some already searching, with some already searching the nearby rooms. Armed and uniformed men go about in pairs, making it so that the house is in a flurry of activity. He lets go of me then, with the knowledge that I'm not going to keel over anytime soon. I was hoping that you would be tired from dealing with the young miss on my return. Instead, you come running and hit your head. Such a troublesome boy. Shall I be carrying you to bed, too? I can manage just fine on my own. Though I don't see how I can sleep until that woman is caught. It'll be easier to keep you safe in your quarters. This is twice we've known the woman to break in. I think we can safely presume that you hold her interest. He says it as a matter of fact, in a tone that brook no argument. Not like I'll argue if it means I'm kept safe. Safety. The two of us hurry upstairs, though we remain watchful and wary of any potential threats to my person. We make it to the master bedroom without any trouble, though, and two of the security are left outside the door. No problems at all. Not until we get inside. Johan's eyes scan the room wildly, a look of dread on his usually stoic face. And I don't understand for a moment. Looking around the bedroom, it's empty. But then I realize... Where's Hana? She came home with you from the hospital, didn't she? She's supposed to be here. I sent one of the maids to accompany her here, to let her rest. One of the maids? I feel the color drain from my face when he raises a hand to stop me from charging out Stay. there. Stay. I'm not staying in here while Hana stays out there. One of the guards will find her and bring her here. And what if they don't? What if that woman gets to her first? What if she already has her? That's not possible. You can't promise that. There's no second thought as I reach 
under my side of the bed and pull out one of my knives. I have no doubt that the other man can take me on if we are both unarmed. But with this, I can even the field, or at least deter him from escalating the situation and risking hurting either of us. I'm going out there to look for Hana, and you're either with me or you aren't. I'm not risking Hana, and I'm not leaving her alone. Still, like a stubborn mule, he refuses to budge from the door. There's a withering look on him that I try to match. One that somehow I'm losing fast to, even with him not saying a word yet. Can you see yourself in the mirror right now? You are in no proper state to go looking for anyone. If it will make you happy, I will do the looking. But please, and don't make me repeat this. Stay. Where it's safe. Where security can find you. We already have one person to be worried about. Please don't add another one to it. Perhaps it is his tone. In spite of his general disdain for virtually everything that has to do with me, I'd like to think that over the years he has grown to care for Hana, at least. Much as I loathe to admit this, I trust him with her safety over any servant in this house. So, an acquiesce. You have two hours, Shuroken. I don't think it'll take that long to find one missing woman in this house. Two hours! Any more than that, and I'm going out there. Of course. Despite his words, he lingers. If I didn't know any better, I'd say he wants to make sure I get in that damn bed and sleep before he turns away from me. What am I, a child? Watching me and treating me like one. There's the reason why we'll never get along. Well, what are you waiting for? And the knife? The knife stays. Very well. Only then does he seem to get the hint. With a nod, he leaves, locks and closes the door behind him. For a moment, I still hear his voice while he gives the guards outside firm instructions. Then a hush as soon as he uh, departs and his footsteps fade away. One that doesn't quite last. As quickly as the silence settles, lightning flashes across the sky, followed immediately by the loud boom of thunder. And that wanker strikes so dangerously close that I can feel the electricity in the air. The power goes out not a second later, and I feel as if I'm being mocked by whatever greater power there is. All is deathly still for a moment, but soon the rain starts once again. Far heavier than the light drizzle from this morning, it's pitter-patter hitting hard against this place's roof. Despite the noise, I find myself drawn to my bed, exhausted, hoping for a little nap. I'm safe here. Hana will be safe too. Shrokin will find her, and when I wake, she'll be here. It does not take long. Once my head hits the pillow, in a matter of minutes, darkness claims me, bringing with it laughters and whispers of a twisted love from a time long gone. Uh, who are you? Hang on. Gotta check out the journal entry. I think we're coming up on November 1st already. I mean, it's evening, October 31st. There he is, pointing his finger at uh, Johans. Stay, stay away! Sweet dreams, my love. It'll be over soon. <laughs> All right, we're we've made it to November first. This is the final day. Everything's going down right now. So what's interesting to me, right? You've got guards. Armed guards all over the house right now, supposedly. Um, or at least two hours prior to where we are now. When Ash arrives at the house, nobody's there. It's completely empty until he runs into Johans in the attic. And uh, he runs into Charlotte, who's crying on the floor, saying that she's done it, mother. It kind of makes me wonder, like... What happened in between? Did all the guards die? Surely they didn't leave, but where are all the bodies, you know? It also seems like it flips back and forth from two different dimensions when Ash is there. We'll be interested to find out. Let's do it. Yeah, that's right. We're not ending the video. Do you think we're going to end the video? We're only like 40 minutes in. Let's do this. Yet, in spite of the unfamiliar voices and unwanted touches from shadows lurking in the dark, rousing is a slow, arduous process. Difficult, every limb heavy with lead. No matter my aversion for the words they murmur in my ears or the sight of her horrid smile from afar, my body refuses to yield. I am at their mercy. Beyond fathomable reason, my consciousness refuses to pull of the waking world, choosing to linger in the pits of a dream, gradually drawing me deeper into unknown depths. Somehow, even if it might mean I may never open my eyes, I allow them. Not that I mind getting a few extra hours, of course. The bed's more than comfortable as it is. After an exhausting day yesterday, babysitting Kylie and the stress of finding an intruder in my own home, I think I deserve a little break every once in a while, especially after going through all that in one single day. 
I can only be on the receiving end of so many unacceptable things within the span of a few hours, you know? As gracious a host and person I am, my patience has its limits too. Although there's still that problem with Hana, I haven't forgotten that, of course, but that's why I hired Shroken. He's competent enough. He won't even last a day in my service if he's any lesser than those halfwits who think they can deceive me with sweet words. He's more than capable of make working on his own without guidance. Let the butler take care of that little problem with Hana while I... Hana. You do not need her. I am here. We are here. This is where your home is. Where you belong for the blood we share. Come back to us. How long has it been since? Johan says never taken this long before. Surely there should have been an update by now. <sighs> All right. So why isn't there? Bloody hell, the Cretans I've surrounded myself with. And isn't that enough reason to force myself out of bed? As it has always been the case. <gasps> My eyes fly open, expecting the warm rays of sunshine filtering through the curtains, only to be greeted by a blinding flash of light and a loud boom of thunder that sounded nearly too close to my ears. Strong gusts of wind will occasionally burst in from the open balcony door, bringing in drizzles of cold rain into the room. Must have left it open earlier before dozing off. The carpet in the floor closest to it is already drenched. Han is going to be so cross when she sees this. Not that it's an immediate problem. If anything, this, it's this power outage we should be minding first. With the intruder still at large, steering through this darkness might be far more fatal than multiple stab wounds or a gunshot to the chest. Oh, great. The power's still out. That is exactly what I need right now. Yes. It's the storm, of course. I should have moved back to the penthouse to weather it in a much more comfortable setting. Already, I can hear the creaks and groans of this old place as rain beats against the windows. Johans, has someone been sent to take the circuit breaker yet? No answer. Johans? Silence. Shroken, someone, anyone? Still nothing, and my cordial mood is quickly dissipating. <sighs> Where are those idiots when you need them? Hana killed all of them. It's really a wonder why he hasn't fixed this yet. Was I really out that long? Can't be. It has only been a few hours after midnight, at the time my wristwatch is anything to go by. Unless I've forgotten to change it again after that last overseas trip a month ago. Though the delay is understandable if he went looking for Hana as he promised. But bloody hell, my safety is also at stake here. Cursing, I stay still, letting my eyes try and adjust to the darkness while my hands fumble for my slippers. If that butler isn't going to fix this, I may as well order the security posted outside to do it. It's probably just a blown fuse. Anyone with a brain can repair one. Grabbing my jacket and with footwear finally on, I make for the door. Although in haste, I pause briefly when a gleam catches my eye. On one of my drawers, underneath the color I've yet to organize, the muzzle of a gun peeks out. Here's the gun. Hana has never openly commented on my possession of it, but I know she does not approve of it, knowing the bloody firearms policy in this nation. Of course, I've never found much use for it in the seven years we've been together. Otherwise, she would have already had it thrown out years ago. Doesn't mean it won't be useful right now. Without second thought, I seize it, sending the stuff piled above it onto the floor. Eh? Whatever. I'll get to it later. This blackout problem should be resolved first. Yes, you've said that like three times. Let's go. Come on. Yes, the power's out. Let's do this. Right next to my missing security detail, as it turns out. Where the fuck did everyone go? There were two, weren't there? Shroken had two blokes posted to stand guard for the night. I might be panicking for a bit earlier, but I'm quite sure I haven't gotten delusional yet. What? Did both of them decide to take a break because they think the master's already sound asleep and won't be looking for them? Damn nitwits. I know assassinations happen very rarely these days, uh, and even less in a peaceful city like Luxburn, but bollocks. There's been a woman going in and out of this place uninvited who may or may not want to put a knife in my back. Isn't that enough reason to stay on alert? I'm fairly certain Shroken won't just enlist their help just for this power outage, only to leave me unprotected. We have a difficult friendship, so to speak, but I doubt that man is an opportunist. I'm holding the lives of his family in my hands, after all. He knows that I am capable of doing. He's not stupid enough to do anything that'll endanger them and save only himself. So where, then? Only my footsteps echo along dark passage, and I am left gripping the handle of my pistol for some sort of comfort. Without proper lighting, and with the storm still raging outside, the stories I've heard about this place seem to have some truth to it. Some. If I'm reaching and wish to entertain myself for a bit, I'll say there might also be ghosts whispering to my ears. Calling. Of course, it's just the wind and the trees rustling outside. Nothing good will come of allowing these thoughts to linger when problems are piling up in front of me one after another. 
especially with what greets me when I get to the foyer. Though it's dark, the large windows illuminate the area much more easily than any of the other rooms. Here we go. I can't believe we're already here. So this is happening after all that stuff. I feel like this page on the right should precede the one on the left. Am I wrong? And we're, we're almost all caught up. This chapter has been very, very tolerable compared to the previous two. All right. From, from where I stand at the top of the stairs, I can easily make out their forms. Okay, Ash. Recognize them, even. It's all gone crazy when these intruders come into my house. I'm no stranger to a cop playing dirty. The smart ones knew that neither life nor criminals are going to play fair. And if one of this wog's sword is in on this, I'm not surprised, too. Huh? But Lily, the estate agent? She doesn't seem the sort. And Daisy, too. He names, he names women after flowers. I never really understood that until now. Huh. What will... Uh, what, a buttercup? Oh my god. I That's never registered. What will Kylie think of her Miss Pink if the poor tyke finds out about this? Not to mention Mint. Hana trusted her. It's only when I hear them back to back that I'm like, oh. I get it. There's a theme. I trust her to be a professional at the very least for fuck's sake. To top it all off, they have the nerve. The NERVE! To look surprised when I announce my presence. Well, well, what have we here? <laughs> if I were any less sober, I'd say this is the beginning of a joke. Bloody trespassers, what is wrong with these people? Did they really think I'll be fine with them walking to my home like this? What are they even doing in here? If I know any better, they might also be behind Hana's disappearance. That's right, my love. They must have a motive. Make them pay. And it better be a good one. Or a bullet to the head is the least of all of them will deserve. Let's see. A photographer, a high school teacher, a real estate agent, an interior designer walk into a mansion. Thunder crackles once again, cutting me off. This time, its sound hits close enough that it nearly feels as if the windows in the ground itself are rumbling. All is deathly still for a moment. I don't let it stop me, however, as I slowly make my way towards them, taking one careful step at a time, relishing the expression of fear in their eyes. I suppose there's something ominous in this setting, with the heavy rain outside and the lack of light here. I kind of like it, to be honest. It adds something to the atmosphere. I suppose I must look like the villain now. But short of me getting close to them, a noise to my left distracts me, briefly halting my movements while curiosity takes over every murmur in my head. And it's a good thing, perhaps, that I did, because as soon as I look up, I see him. Another trespasser. Great. Just as he's about to jump down from furniture that has somehow ended up piled and blocking the door to the, pile to the parlor. What happened there? And did he really think it's all, all right to do that in another person's house? Lout. Teach him, my lord. Put him in his place. My hands are already moving before any rationale can stop me. Fingers firm at my gun when I finally release the safety from it and take aim. Not at him, but at his friends. They are his, aren't they? Why else would they be here together? Doesn't matter. He won't let the people he cares about be harmed. My finger on the trigger is more than itching to shoot, but I hold back. Sure, I could have simply taken aim at him. But more than seeing him bleed, I want to see the expression on his face once he realizes everything he's doing is futile. He's trapped. Lives are in my hands. His life's in my hand. Had I known there would be a party in my own home tonight, I would have opened a bloody bottle or two. People these days, in my own home. Can you believe it? I feel so left out. I can tell the exact moment the realization dawns on him. A short second of his body freezing and blood draining from his face, as soon as his feet hits the floor, he looks up. He's already a prey, trapped by his own recklessness. Oh, pathetic. And really, Daisy, even you, what would Kylie say? Luke, this isn't what you're thinking. You have to listen to us. There's something going on here. Well, obviously, why else would people be trespassing in my home? What about little Lily over there, then? What's your excuse? Checking back if your clients are doing okay? Is that it? Is this what this is? We're doing good, by the way. Sir, please. Oh, please what? Becca's right, sir. We need to get out of this place. 
you need... Tut, tut, not a good enough excuse, Sorry. darling. You people are the ones who need to get out of my sight. Don't worry. I might consider pressing lighter charges for the woman. Can't say the same for the rest of you. But really now? I swear the people of this city need to be taught the meaning of privacy. This is how you want to start the week. Why don't we just go with a bloody massacre if we want to surprise people in their homes, huh? It's just a passing remark, of course. I'm not stupid enough to do something that'll bring negative attention to myself. Reputation and all that, I just can't risk it. The thought of having dead bodies here, ones that I'm not even responsible for, they're the ones who trespassed. It's... it's already quite too much. It'll literally be overkill, especially for someone like me. Nevertheless, joke or not, Feathers wastes no time drawing his own gun at the slight wave of my own. Even if he knows it's already too late. Still, he glares at me. Still, he fights back. Now, now, Feathers. Manners. You're in no position to be pointing that gun at people. There's no desperation in him like I'm hoping. Just an annoyance flickering shortly before being hidden underneath a challenge. The likes of him are the kind of people I hate the most. And with their failures already glaring down at them, mocking every worthless move they make, they have the impudence to stare people in the eye. Why don't you put yours down first, and then we'll talk about manners. Uh, uh, uh. Hate Ash. Mm. Oh, he talked back the gall. You know, your kind pisses me off so much. Annoying most of the time, like a damn pest you can't be rid of. But to some degree it is. Commendable. I'll give him that. After all, we're almost the same in that regard. Almost. I'm still the better person, of course. <laughs> Fucking... Come on. <laughs> He tells me to put the gun down, but I see no reason why I should. I'm a homeowner in defense of my own home. I have the right, I'd like to think. Stand your ground laws. Questionable permit of firearms aside. It's not like I wanted this, but I'm already high strung and their presence does not help. Bloody peasants. I can never seem to figure out how their minds fully work. Take this one, for example. Despite the pride brimming in him, how he matches my glare with one of his own, he simply lowers his pistol after a long second. Not in surrender. The tent set in his shoulders tell me tells me as much. But the closest he can get to lowering his own ego in favor of something I can't quite place. Interesting. Gotta admit, I'm almost disappointed. As you should be, my lord. I'm expecting him to hold out until one of us shoots the other. Can't see it'll be more exciting that way. A bullet inside any part of my body isn't something I'd like to have on a bad day like today. Or any day, for that matter. But it'll surely be predictable of him. And I like predictable. They're the kinds of people who are easiest to deal with, no matter the situation. With them, there's no second guessing what they'll do. He shoots, I shoot. One of us dies, the other walks away. Nothing complicated. Nothing requiring much brain power, just muscle memory and who's the better shooter. End of story. Yet here he is, dragging a deep breath in and settled, setting aside the only thing protecting him. I can easily shoot him this way, be done with this whole farce of a conversation. Instead, I find myself listening. A concession for a person who in another life would have also become the person I am today, had his circumstances allowed it. Damn shame. We might have gotten along. Listen, right. I need you to- Very stereotypical villain monologue where he's like, You and I aren't so different, hero. Come on. But alas. You broke into my house, and somehow, somehow, you expect me to listen like a good little boy. Are you a bit touched in the head, Feathers? I'm not the one breaking laws here. Look here, fucker. If I wanted you dead, I could have done it so many times already. Oh, well, you're so good. In fact, I can easily shoot you down right here, right now. Didn't you put your gun down? And you won't be able to do a damn thing, even with that gun. A meeting of two prideful blokes will never go well, whichever lifetime it is. <laughs> And I can only laugh at his audacity, his lack of shame and fear, even facing the business end of my pistol. You know what I'm thinking right now? In another lifetime, we would have probably gotten along well. The best truth I can offer him, not many people, those who have slighted me in particular, live this long to see it. Yes, especially when he has a lot to answer. Preferably right now, because as generous as I have been so far, my patience has its limits. My amusement can only last for so long. In two steps, I'm staying in front of him, grabbing him by the collar and resting the whole the cold muzzle of the eagle against his temple. It's a desert eagle, huh? Isabella says, Ashton! Luke, no! For some reason, hers wasn't voice acted. Hey, now you two, I, I'm sure we can all talk about this first! He'll end up with a pretty smear on the wall this close. 
What is it that you people really want with me? This is the second time this week, and I'm really getting weary of this little game. Did the NCA send you to apprehend me? Or has somebody paid you off to kill me? Which one is it, feathers? Mind you, my arm's getting tired. Better answer quick if you don't want to beat the business end of this gun. And he knows it. Of course he does. Hitman or not, he has been trained, judging purely from his stance. But not many bothered to be as cautious as him. One glimpse at my handgun's safety earlier is all it took for him to see I mean business. Similar. Too similar. We're too alike in so many little ways, it's funny. Okay, yeah, we get it. We get it. We guys are really alike. Down to the fact that he doesn't even flinch, no matter how heavy the threats of my words are. Even knowing how one flick of my finger on the trigger will be enough to end his sorry life. He should have caved in by now, started begging like so many others before him. Instead, he throws more vitriol, adds more kindling to a fire already burning. I'm not with NCA. I'm just here to help. There's something else in this house, and we're all in danger. You have to believe me, right? You need to let us go. You need to get out of here before it's too late. If you want to keep your sorry ass alive, you'll listen to people with more brain cells than you. There it is. Igniting it further that I can't help but return it to him with equal fervor. We don't need him, my love, is what the whispers are supposed to be saying. Why, you insolent! Why include voice acting in the ultimate scene of the entire visual novel? Why include it? We both decide to move in that moment, both our bodies tensing, each of us racing to get ahead of the other. However, before we can even get a head start, a voice unexpectedly rings above the chaos about to ensue! <laughs> Hana? Okay, so, what happens after this? Oh, Luke, darling, my love. What do you think you're doing out here this late? The woman that stands there is the one that I married, the love of my life. So why is it that the look she gives me now makes me feel so revolted? Makes it so that there is just a sense, general sense of wrongness in the way she smiles at me. Oh, 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 thank goodness, it's just you. Oh, you gave me quite the fright. We've been looking all over for you. Saying this makes my tongue feel heavy. I'm so used to lying to putting on a face, but this just feels so wrong. Such a small lie, yet a big one at that. To be afraid at the sight of my own wife for no apparent reason is illogical, yet her mere presence has been disturbing. It's kind of hot. <laughs> from, from her suddenly devoted and near-dependent nature, her obsession and possessiveness to her strange way of speaking, something has been wrong with Hana as of late. I didn't want to admit it, but it was almost as if she turned to another person overnight. And looking up at her now only seems to solidify this. It's almost as if I can't recognize my own wife. Fetch me! Whatever for, my prince? Look, that doesn't matter right now. You need to get out of this house right now, alright? Stay in the penthouse for a while. Leave our home? What if I wish to stay? It's not safe here, darling. Now is not the time to explain. Just listen to me. Okay, Buttercup? I hold up my hand to her in the hopes that she won't ask any more questions. I shove away the ill thoughts I have about her, about how this is not the wife I married. People change, and now is not the time to have some sort of existential crisis about it. Our safety is priority right now, and I feel better about all of this as long as I can have her by my side. But she barely budges from her place atop the stairs, let alone to take my hand. And the way she looks at me just sends chills down my spine. Why should I? Is something the matter? What about you? Are you not coming with? What was I supposed to say? Where to even start? Maybe just to confess there's some crazy lady roaming around and I'd really like it if we just stayed safe? You just need to leave for a while so I can let security sweep the place. A a and someone has to be there, yes? To supervise and all. That'll be my job, Buttercup. Still, nothing. She doesn't move from where she stands, still with that amused grin on her face, as if this is all some funny joke and she's the only one who can see the punchline. But I do not wish to leave. And you should not either. You've just arrived, my prince. This is your home. Our home. Would you really allow others to drive us away from it? Be that as it may, it is dangerous here right now, and I'd rather have you safe than, oh, I don't know, comfortable or whatever argument you wish to bring up. This is ridiculous, Hana! We shouldn't be discussing this! You need to leave now. Let me handle things here, Buttercup. It is then that her expression turns absolutely horrific, and everything turns to complete and utter shite. Hang on. I, just, I, I like looking at the timeline. It's fun. So this is gonna be the very last entry, which I wish it would just, whenever there's a new entry, I wish it would just start at the page where there's a new entry. Instead of having to turn there every time. Okay, so it's just exactly what we're seeing right now. All right. 
Hana's body shudders and shakes as if she's about to have a seizure until her visage ripples and changes. Golden yellow hair is slowly stained with inky black, and her face melts into that of the woman, the maid from before, with a menacing expression on her face. Along with it is the shifting of the very ground we stand on. It's a slow thing, a whisper more than a bang as the darkness creeps into every corner of the room. The walls shudder and groan. Blood runs from the ceiling, crawls down the walls, and stains the floor. It feels as if life itself is being sucked from the house slowly but surely. The beauty of the place is gone, with only the dead, decaying remains of the mansion left in its wake. I don't have to wonder if it is just the foyer that's become this nightmarish place. I can already hear it. Gone are the growling of thunder and the lashings of rain and wind against the foyer's high windows. All of it has been replaced by a more grating sound. A cacophony of voices from nowhere and everywhere echoing through the now horrid walls. Voice that neither belongs to us nor the people who live here. What? What's going on? Help! Please! All throughout the house, shouts of alarm and surprise ring out. A mirror to the horror creeping up in each of us. Who wouldn't be shocked? This is insane. Even Daisy, feisty woman that she is, trembles at the sight of it, clinging desperately to Lily while Steel and Feathers stand protectively in front of the two. Steel? Is that Zack? I haven't heard him call Zack anything yet. Brave of them, I have to admit, to put themselves in the front line like that. Though it doesn't necessarily mean they don't feel the same fear as the rest of us. Something I don't blame them for. There seems to be no end in sight to this insanity. If anything, this only feels like it's the beginning. Of the end. Help me! Oh my god! Please! Somebody! Anybody! Uh, who are you? Stay! Stay away! No, no, no! Stay away! Stay! Stay away! Sounds like Johan's voice actor. The screams fill the mansion. <laughs> she laughs all the while, a harsh, agonizing sound that goes on for what feels like forever. Until there's nothing but silence, her horrid smile and her pale hands reaching out to me. Calling, beckoning, pleading. I'm terrified, I really am, like I should be. But I have never been one to truly stay afraid. I have long learned the fear that fear will not get me anywhere. Cowering in a corner doesn't help keep me safe and will not keep me alive. Not like rage does. I've learned to use this burning hate inside of me to survive. There's no difference now. Uh, stay away from me! Why? Why do you wish to leave? This is where you belong, my lord. Remember the blood we share? This is your home. The blood we share? Is he a descendant of her? That'd be weird if... That'd be weird, though. Okay, I don't know, I'm not gonna think about it too hard. Don't you remember? You promised to return. To stay together with me. With us. With people no different from you. Don't listen to her, she lies. I promised no such thing to anyone. We bought this house weeks ago. How should I know what she's bobbling about? I never even wanted to be here in the first place. A terrible case of mistaken identity. That must be it. I'm quite sure of it. I don't know this woman, this monster. Why would I say that to someone like her? In my entire lifetime, I've only made and kept sincere promises to mere two people, Hannah Evans and Eleanor Chandler. No one else. The rest of those who claim I promised them anything to them can go fuck themselves. Bloody hell, I may enjoy the company of women. I'm not an idiot to start spouting such nonsense to anyone. A line must be drawn, even especially if I am to keep myself alive. Yet she still goes on, insists, making me appear a liar in front of these people. Of course you still deny it. Have you truly forgotten? You haven't changed, I see. Still a deceiver. She's lying! You see, my love, nothing has changed. Still no difference, you and I. Just like the rest of us. Just like every single soul in this putrid wreck. We waited for so long. You can hear them, yes? Their pleas, their calls, their invitation. Come, my lord. The house seeks its master. She, the monster reaches out again, her hands a gory, abhorrent sight, along with that smile spread across her face. My body is already moving on instinct, stumbling back one step at a time in a desperate bid to be away from her. Anything to put distance between me and this vile creature. No matter what she says, I am nothing like her. I need to get out of this house. Out of this country, preferably. 
There's nothing for me here. Not anymore. Nothing to keep tied to this place. With Hana beyond saving, no longer the same woman I knew, and Shroken likely taken by this woman, nothing's left to bind me to this wretched city. I can leave. I can... My foot steps on something, sending me sliding on my back and flat on the floor. Beside me, a paper, familiar one, flutters down. It's this thing again from the open house. Though it feels less like a gimmick and more like a threat book with recent events. It must have fallen from one of these peasants in the commotion earlier. For a moment they appear conflicted to see it in my hands, but wisely keep their opinions to themselves. Leaving the damn thing to simply bear its grisly message for everyone in the room to see. Help me. Help me. Help me. Is this it? What they've been telling us? Why everything in my life has gone to shite? Because of some stupid old letter? An invitation indeed. One I am not willing to accept. Not any time. From the top of the stairs, the creature moves again, drawing my attention back to her. Her gait remains slow and awkward as she walks forward, that smile never leaving her. But I don't. I won't give her the chance. I am not dying here. I certainly am not giving myself to a hideous creature like her, either. Adrenaline kicks in, and despite panic gasp and worried glances from Daisy's friends, I pay them no mind as I reach for the main door and... Without warning, it slams open, revealing not the mansion grounds I am expecting. Before my mind can even comprehend what's happening, black tendrils have already coiled tightly around my limbs, dragging every person in the foyer into the room. None of us even get to scream when darkness completely envelops us upon the door's clothing. A uh, closing. Understand where your place is now, my love. What? You belong here. Is it so difficult to grasp? We've been waiting. <laughs> There's a moment of panic when the feeling of the tendrils around my limbs finally dissipates. As soon as my eyes adjust to the darkness of the room and I'm on my feet, I'm reaching for my knife and holding it out, watching, waiting for every moment, movement, using it as a way to put distance between me and these peasants. Who knows what they'll do now? We're all desperate to get out of this house. There's only six of us in this room, four of them, friends at that. Though Mint has already gone loon, crouched in a corner and muttering to herself, you can't really say anyone's safe from her. If anything, she's the one I should watch out for. I can't trust these people not to turn on me. I can't trust anyone. Not anymore. Not after this. Despite the pleading looks Lily shoots my way after they all huddle in the corner behind steel and feathers. But I have to remind myself that even people like her are capable of doing the unpleasant. She's the only human, after all. It's never an excuse. Why, even Hana has her cunning, manipulative moments, though she does it much subtler than I. Why else would Lily show this letter to us that day if not to save herself? I guess that backfired on her now that she and her own friends are also stuck here. Still, I have every right to be livid. Everything, everything that I have built has fallen apart. All because these people came into our lives. You! All of you! This is all your fault! If I've died to this bloody case, I'm taking you all down with me! Hey now, Mr. Wright! I, I know the situation ain't good, but we have to calm down. We're all in the same boat here. You shut your mouth! If it weren't for you, or this letter, for all of you, none of this would have happened. Anna would still be. Suddenly, Daisy steps up and slaps the knife away from my hand. Don't you dare, Luke. Don't you dare put that blame on us. God. Without batting an eye, glaring at me as if she might just rip my head off in this instant. Said knife slides uselessly under the table, out of my reach. I should have expected she's not the kind to submit even under threat. Right now, all of us appear smaller facing her anger. Whatever. Last I checked, we're the ones trying to do the saving here. Again, grand finale. Why bother to check and make sure all the voice acting's in the game? Why do that? Why double check? Let's just leave it. And what about your friend over there? Are you saying she is responsible for this mess? For the lives this sorting letter took? Dragging other people into her own problems just so she could save her little sorry self? You think I haven't seen that before? Getting real tired of your double standards, Daisy! You know this curse is an entirely different issue, Luke. Because, knowing you, I don't doubt that even without that blasted letter, you would have eventually... Rebecca, stop! All of you stop this! To hear Lily speak out loud, I can't say I'm not surprised. She has always given me the impression of someone so meek from the moment I've met her, either from her inexperience or her station in life. She has never struck me as someone fitting to be a real estate agent. Until now. Quietly, she puts herself between me and Daisy, cutting whatever scathing words we've yet to hurl at the other. The way she glares at me reminds me a little of the way my own mum would look at me. Particularly when I've done something wrong, and it's not a stare she's unused to showing. She has done this before, probably to a younger sibling. Huh. 
If she only sees us now as a pair of squabbling kids, not two mature adults, well, that's only to be expected. No doubt that's how she sees us. For a long moment, there's only silence in the room. Steel, the big oaf, doesn't even dare break it, neither does feathers. With both merely watching us, bunch of wimps, these men. Not that it matters when Lily starts speaking again after some of the anger and tension is lifted from the room. Stop this, please! With or without that damn piece of paper, we... A deep breath, an exhale, and then she closes her eyes, a crease forming be between her eyebrows while she grips her hand tightly in front of her. We still would have ended up in this mess. The atmosphere that descends into the room right after that, admission is anything but pleasant. Can I call it that? An admission? It seems like it from the way her eyes nervously flick between her friends and I. She appears to know more than she lets on, and how she makes herself appear smaller after dropping that bomb on us doesn't sit quite well with me. And patience is something I don't have the luxury of having right now and bestowing upon other people. What else does this girl know? What else is she not telling us? Because from the looks of this, even her friends has no idea what she's talking about. Unwilling to wait, I grab her arm before she retreats without explanation, waving the letter still in my hand in front of her. Ow! Sir, you're hurting me! Hey, hands off her, right? Fuck off, Feathers. I have questions for your friend, and she better have the answers. Luke, will you stop taking it out on every single person? Your friend is hiding something, Daisy. She struggles for a moment, but my hold eventually forces her to look up at me. Fear and uncertainty spreads across her features, especially when her eyes land on the damned paper. As much as I want to be considerate right now, I want answers. What do you mean, Lily? What do you mean, considerate? I... I'm not sure about it. Don't give me that, you know something! Ow! Please, sir! I... I know the paper's useless, okay? At the mention of the letter, all of a sudden, Mint stands. I've almost forgotten she's here, her ramblings having faded away in the shouting. Without warning, she snatches the paper out of my hand. It's a miracle it didn't rip right then and there, but the way she glares at it, I think she may want to do exactly that. We should have gotten rid of this thing! We should have burned it at the first opportunity we got! No! Even if we rip it to shreds, it won't do anything! I... I think... You don't know what I've seen, Santos. Oh. The video is about to be like... Whatever. But no, she, she means the video. There were children! Victims! All because they had no idea what this thing would do to them! Oh god, those poor souls! They were screaming and begging before she... Then, what about those people they mentioned in the news lately? All those who died? My co-workers? The open house clients? None of them had seen it! Even Rose! And yet they're all dead! I should know! That letter has been with me since I picked it up! Wait, didn't Rose see it, though? And... and I swear I didn't make copies of this thing! Even if I wanted to save myself, I wouldn't do that to my friends. Or anyone. Is that what the trip to BRC was for? Yes, I'm sorry. I couldn't tell you guys until I was certain. None of you believed me the first time. I had to find proof. And yet we're all here! Are you taking me for a fool, Lily? I have to go with Whiskey on this. Who knows how many has already seen this before you found it? This cursed thing has to go! We would have ended up here either way. M maybe? I, I really don't know. Sir, please. All I know is that paper isn't the reason why all of this is happening. There's something else that... This place... Steel has been quiet this entire time, but the sound of him talking, however whispered it is, still manages to catch us all off guard. We all pause, turning to him with likely the same questions in our eyes. What? Oh, uh, I just thought, I mean, it, it's a straight thought, I don't take my word for it. Zach, do you not hear the music in the background? This is frantic, this is fast paced, let's go, let's go. No, it might be something. What about this place, Zach? There's still a moment where he hesitates, but Lily's urging especially, eventually spurs him into speaking. I was just thinking, maybe Ash is right for why you went here. This is where Bella found that thing, right? And then this. It was just a hunch, Zach. We were not getting anywhere. But just because we went here doesn't mean we will find all the answers we need here. Hell, now we're stuck here. Regardless, Steel pauses, allowing Lily to remember. Soon enough, whatever it is dawns on her and her face lights up with something like hope? Of all things, in this nightmare, hope? Her head snaps up and she reaches for Steel's arm to give it a squeeze. A reassurance or a confirmation? The meaning is lost even to Daisy who glances at them, baffled. Belle, what are you- Becca, it's this place. Think about it. What? 
You mean, like, burn this place down? I still think we should get rid of this letter before we start thinking of destroying a place with some historical value! What? No! We are not burning a multi-million pound mansion, you peasants! I just spent a fortune on this! Hana did, but okay. Bloody fucking hell! Not only do I have trespassers on my property, but they're also arsonists! How dare they suggest something like that, bloody peasants. My head's already aching just listening to them. To think this is all the solution they can come up with? I should have just stabbed all of them and made a run for it. Doesn't help that with each second we spend talking here, the crazier this whole place gets. The voices have become louder and somehow sounding more vicious. If the things in this room start floating, mark my words, I will fucking flip out. And they may not be thinking of it right now, but eventually, eventually they'll turn on me, such as the nature of humans. Better find a way out of this place as soon as possible if I want to stay alive. Fuck, I still have so much to do. None of your choices seem sound, but who knows? We don't understand the shite about this place. Might as well try everything, yeah? Whatever works. If I also have to be the one to make that blade decision, so be it. Less room for errors with the only sane one doing the thinking. On the off chance I'm wrong, well, they suggested it. Alright, guys. So we can either burn the letter or burn the mansion. How close would you say we are to the end? I'm gonna... Well, I'm gonna save. Nevertheless, I'm gonna take a look real quick. See how far we are. We're like, right here. So there's still quite a bit to go. Like, look at all this. Let me check real quick. Cause like, if we're, if we're about to like, see the finale, I don't want to end the video here. Just to be perfectly candid. But we're in the middle right now. And it's like... Interesting. So, depending on the choice here, we go up to this top, top line, and depending on different choices, it can just go all the way to the end, I think. Okay, well, I'm not really sure, so I'm gonna say we'll end this one on a cliffhanger. Sorry. Uh, but it's, it's been a long episode, so I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.